Hi. <laughs> okay, welcome, welcome back to This Week in Global Health, otherwise known as TWIG. TWIG is a weekly live global health news roundup. It's for the good, the bad, the ugly, and the interesting in the global health space. We're broadcasting live, so firstly, hello to the live audience, and you guys can tweet us or send in comments via the web page. We're going to try and respond to those later. And then, of course, this is also going to be available on YouTube, so if you're watching this on YouTube at some other time, hello to you. And, of course, we've got a podcast, so you might be listening to the audio version of this on the podcast. Okay, we have been talking in the month of January about health systems, and health systems have got multiple building blocks, and we've been dealing with them kind of uh, in bits and pieces. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about leadership and finance. So these are the two building blocks and health systems we're going to talk about today. Before we carry on, I'm going to ask the panel members to introduce themselves. I'll start with myself. My name is Greg Martin. I'm coming to you from Dublin, where it's relatively cold. Uh, I'm going to be talking about leadership in the global health space, and in particular, leadership at the supranational level. Uh, next up, Brian. Hi, Brian Simpson from Global Health Now at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, Maryland. I'll be bringing you two of the top stories of the week in global health and also a contest uh, for untold stories in global health. Okay, and of course, as always, just a quick advert, the Global Health Now newsletter is phenomenal. We recommend it 100%. Uh, okay, <laughs> next up, Jessica. Hey, everyone. I'm Jessica Taff. I'm coming to you from the Washington, D.C. metro area where we have a little snow on the ground, not the crazy storm that we're supposed to get. Um, and my heart goes out to the people of the Northeast that are dealing with all that snow. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about healthcare financing um, and also ways that countries can do some innovative financing if they're running low on health budgets. Nice. Super duper interesting. Next up, Terry. Hey everybody, Terry Schmidt giving you a uh, hello from Southern California, 68 degrees. I'm going to talk about a case study when we're talking about health systems finance. I'm going to talk about Taiwan. Okay, thanks very much, Terry. Looking forward to that. And of course, our lovely smiling Agnes. Agnes, talk to us. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Agnes, nervously from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'll be talking to you about the role of ministries of health uh, in uh, leadership and governance at the country level. Look forward to this. Thanks. Thanks very much, Agnes. And last but not least, of course, Katie. I was going to say, I'm not the lovely smiley one. Um, <laughs> <I'm everyone. laughs> I'm smiling for you, Katie. <laughs> uh, my name is Katie, and I'm coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden, where we are a bit chilly and we have some snow on the ground. And I'm going to be talking to you today about some case studies about uh, different countries and different approaches when they're cutting budgets and how that affects healthcare. Okay, thanks very much, Katie. Okay, as always, we're going to start off with the news roundup. Right, Brian, over to you. Tell us what's in the news in the global health space right now, this week. Hit us. Sure, sure. Well, I'm going to start off with a quick plug for the contest that we have for untold stories in global health, and we're co-sponsoring it with the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, and we're looking for important stories that are ignored or underreported by the global media. Um, we are committed to, um, once we arrive at what the most important story is, we are going to send a journalist to the uh, to report on the story firsthand in glo for Global Health Now, and then also hopefully it will be picked up by other media outlets. So our mission is to raise awareness awareness about a really important issue that's not getting enough attention. So if you're interested, please, um, you can Google uh, Global Health Now, and we have a link off of our uh, homepage there. So anyways, just a little plug there. Okay, um, we can, Brian, we can stick a link as well in our show notes, um, because that, that, sounds like a, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Uh, so yes, let's get that into our show notes as well. Perfect. Okay, great. Yep, you'll you'll find it there. Um, the first story that I really caught my attention this week was from Sunday in the New York Times. Jeffrey Gettleman reporting from Africa on the use and misuse of insect insecticide treated mosquito nets. So um, we all know how hundreds of millions of these mosquito nets have been distributed in Africa in recent years, and they're also. Um, but Gettleman reports on they're also finding their ways. Into, uh, into rivers and coastal areas because people are using them as fishing nets. So there's a real concern there about the effects for the fish populations, especially catching the younger fish, and then also the possible release of toxins into the water. And I know Global Health Now has a big uh, episode coming up on this issue, so I'll stop, I'll stop there, but I think that's a really, it's going to be a great topic to discuss. Brian, that's super interesting. You, you know, before the show when we were talking, you gave a little quote or an example of, you know, you, you gave it one of the rationales of the people that are doing this. Could you just bring that back into the show because it was super interesting? 
Absolutely. Yeah. So this was uh, also from Jeffrey Gettleman's piece in the New York Times, but he quoted a Zambian uh, fisherman who said, I know it's not right, but without these nets, we wouldn't eat. Right. So okay. And that just highlights really shows how tough. We, we shouldn't be pointing fingers. We should be coming up with solutions. Exactly. Exactly. Great. And speaking of another solution, um, the Serum Institute of India, it's, which is a Asia's uh, largest vaccine maker, reports that it's uh, going to deliver by 2018 some new low-price vaccines for everything from HPV and, and severe diarrhea to pneumonia. So they're all in the works, and they're they're discussing, you know, bringing out these uh, vaccines at a cost uh, that would be like one third of the typical cost uh, that uh, that, that pharmaceutical com large pharmaceutical companies are charging right now. So an interesting sort of side note um, that caught my attention to the uh, large Gavi conference in Berlin, where seven uh, for where international donors pledged 7.5 billion for for vaccines. And certainly, if the vaccines cost a little bit less, they would uh, that 7.5 billion would go a lot further. Nice, brilliant, exciting stuff. We always love stories about vaccines. Big yes, fans of vaccines. Has anyone got control of the sound effects? We should put in. We should do like a, a chair for vaccines right there. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very All much, right. Brian. Thanks, All right, Greg. So that, we we we'll see we'll see you next time, Brian. Same time, same time, same place. Thanks always. We love your contribution. Thanks so much. We'll see you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. We're gonna move right along, and I'm gonna ask Jessica. Jessica, could you talk to us about healthcare financing? Healthcare financing, what are the options? How does it work? Give us the lowdown. All right, okay. So there's two main ways that societies can finance healthcare. It can be financed by the government, and this is a really common way that happens in a lot of developed countries. Or it can be market-based, and this means that private individuals pay for healthcare, and that's mostly out of pocket, and a lot of healthcare is also provided by individuals as well. In this latter system, um, the market-based system, there's a lot of competition, and this promotes a more medical advances than the single-payer system, um, which is, like I said, the single-payer government finance system. But you also have to keep in mind that um, in the single-payer government system, it means that, or sorry, not in the single-payer government system, um, in the market-based system, because it's, it's individuals, it's out-of-pocket, all individuals may not be able to receive or afford basic level of health care. That's what you normally get in a government-based system. But another caveat to the government-based system is that budgets may affect the way the money, is health, uh, money on health is spent. For instance, in a recession, they might start thinking about ways to cut back on, I mean, all of their budgets, but including health. So, important to think about these two different systems of, of paying for health. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And of course, something I was I was reading not long ago about, uh, and I can't remember the exact numbers. And we might, I'll try and find a link, and we'll put it in the show notes about how, in there's some places in the world where, in in private healthcare systems, the number one reason in those countries for a person being pushed into abject poverty are unforeseen health costs. Definitely. Um, and I mean, part of the reason for that is pe people that are unwell or family members of unwell people are not rational consumers, uh, and they will buy as much healthcare as is available, um, and often in a way that just doesn't make sense, and actually in 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 a, in a way that they very often cannot afford. Um, so it's yeah, that's that's an interesting. Um, sorry, I didn't. You, I didn't. I don't know if you even finished, Jessica. I jumped right in there, but carry on, please. Oh no, no, that's pretty much what I was going to say on that. But I know Katie was going to yeah. kind of follow up. She had some comments that we talked about earlier. Yeah, so just a really good point that, uh, you know, budgets and how a government has a budget to work with and, and where healthcare falls in that. And it's a really good example recently with the economic crises we've had that show where health falls when governments are trying to save money. So the two examples I chose to show were Greece and Iceland. Greece obviously famously had a really big economic crisis and they took a loan from international community and that loan stipulated that they cut back on social services as a lot of loans ha have these strings attached to it when they lend money. So the loan it dictated that it had to cut back um, and they meant that it cut back by 25% um, their hospital budget and slash funding for mental health problems by 55%. And obviously when these things happen, there's there's effects of them. So an analysis said that uh, for, the suicides increased by 45% over a four-year period and the case of depression more than doubled. Alongside with that, infant mortality rose by 43%. 
They also had its first case of locally spread malaria in 40 years. So unforeseen things came out of this, this uh, budget cut. In comparison, Iceland went the other direction. They did not take a loan from the international community to bail out their banks. And instead, they uh, reduced in other ways. So they didn't cut their services. Um, and that meant that they asked their employees and other citizens to work a little bit less, take a little bit less salary, and cut it in across the board instead of just in the social services. Um, this meant actually that the Icelandic people were really healthy during their economic crisis. They walked more. They ate uh, at home more. They ate more vegetables. They didn't uh, spend, you know, go out to the movies. Uh, they didn't drink a lot. They bought less cigarettes. And uh, it's just an example of the fact that if they didn't cut the services they knew were there, they were still able to act normal um, and were able to live quite well and quite healthily. So it's just really interesting comparison. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, we, we, we're probably going to do a whole episode at some point looking at uh, health financing, but in, in particular, where loans have strings attached to them that require governments to cut back on services. And we know that they were, were, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, they were the structural adjustment programs of the, of the World Bank. Uh, super interesting. We can't get into that in this show, but I think it would be worth us kind of setting aside an entire show just to look at that. And another thing that we should do an entire show on are the economic benefits to investing in health. And, and again, we can't, I mean, that's a, that's a whole show, that's a whole it's, hour's talk on its own, yeah. but it's super interesting. And, and you know, countries do better off economically mm -hmm. if they invest in, in healthcare. And it's I, been touted the, the best investment, and with the MDG's review coming up, like, it's saying if you invest in health, everything else follows suit, which is amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Jessica, innovative financing, talk to us. Yeah, so I think, all right, so Katie brings up some really, really interesting points, um, especially with what happened in Greece, and that's, it's, that makes the case, in a case, and you were just saying, there's so many reasons that we should be investing in health, but in these government-based systems, how do you finance it if you're, if you have to cut back, so what do you do? Well, there's a number of ways, and you may or may not have heard the term innovative finance. This gets tossed around a lot, but basically what this means, it's, you're, it's about finding novel ways to raise revenue to fund health programs. Now, this includes newer additional taxes that can be earmarked for health programs. For instance, things like a SIN tax, now a SIN, uh, and this could be on tobacco and alcohol or sugary drinks. Now, Thailand did this, and they raised $57.9 million between 1996 and 2011, and they reduced the sale of alcohol and tobacco, so win-win right? Uh, other ways are you can have set up trust funds that are specifically for a health, uh, specific health programs. You can do a debt swap uh, where a creditor country cancels another country's debt so that it will um, invest specifically in health projects. There are also loans and bonds that are closely tied to results and it rewards the investors upon achievement of uh, agreed upon results. Or you can also incentivize the private sector to finance health programs, projects, etc. right? Now this is, like I said, just a few of the different innovative financing mechanisms that are con uh, being implemented or being discussed at the moment. There's so many out there, and we'll have some links in our show notes if you want to find more about it. Okay, I love the phrase syntax. You know, I was thinking if that's just a general syntax, some of us would be bankrupt long, long, long ah. ago. <laughs> yep. uh, <laughs> other good examples of innovative financing, there's Unitaid. Um, now, Unitaid gets a lot of its money, not all of its money, some of it just comes from, from donor countries, but a lot of the Unitaid money, which gets used to finance products for HIV, TB, and malaria, comes from an airline tax. So there's certain countries that have said, look, any flights that get booked, any tickets that get booked in this country, a certain percentage of the price of that ticket gets earmarked to be given to Unitaid. So it's a fantastic, it's another sort of innovative financing mechanism where there's money that's sustainable and it's not dependent on uh, on, on, on bilateral or multilateral donor uh, arrangements. You know, so and a great, and there was also another great one was the, the Gavi uh, vaccine bond. Super interesting. Can't get into it now. Too complicated. No, but. I just want to interrupt really quickly. It's actually great timing today. There was actually in Canada something called Let's Talk, which is, is something of if you send a text about mental health, the, the I don't know a cent gets donated, and it's by a really big telecommunications company in Canada. So really interesting ways uh, that that's being done and relevant for today. Wow, great example. Love it. Okay, we're going to look at a country example of how finance is important and has implications for health. Uh, Terry, Terry, you're going to give us uh, a little bit of a, a quick example of, uh, I can't even remember which country, T Taiwan? Sure, okay. Yes, Greg. So I want to just talk to you about Taiwan. Taiwan is actually known as the Republic of China officially. It's an island country, 34 million people. 
um, implemented national health insurance about 20 years ago. Before they implemented, they had 57% of the people covered. Now they're at 98. When we talk about Jessica's examples, they have their premium base, but a single payer system. So the premiums come from employers, the insured, and the government. It takes about 6.6 .6 of the GMP. They don't. They spend a moderate amount of money. That's about twenty-four hundred dollars per person versus the U.S. It's eight thousand. U.K. is at thirty-five hundred. There are huge excess. Eighty percent of the population support them, but they have issues. So we have workforce issues, overuse of medical resources, hospital budget issues, drug pricing. All these things are compounding, but are challenges for them and moving forward. Okay, super interesting. Well, we're going to wrap up on the finance part of, of today's show, and we're going to move over to the idea of leadership and governance. And when we talk about leadership and governance, we, we often think about it in, uh, at two levels, or actually multiple levels, but to, to simplify it, we can think about it at the supranational level or above countries. You know, in other words, uh, supranational structures are usually structures that don't fall under the aegis of any particular nation state. Uh, and then, of course, at a country level. So I'm gonna, but before we carry on, what I'm going to do is perhaps try and give you a very brief definition of what it is that we mean by leadership and governance, because I think these, these terms get touted around a lot. You look up a definition in a dictionary, it's usually half a page long and doesn't make much sense. My simplified definition of the idea of leadership is it's, the, it, it's defined by the extent to which you're able to command a following and direct them towards a, a vision, right? So if, if you have a following and you can direct them in a particular direction, that's leadership, right? No following, no leadership. You know what I mean? No vision, then you, you're directing them nowhere. So if, you, if you've got a following of some description, it could be you as an individual, you have individuals following you, or you as an institution, you have individuals or institutions. It doesn't matter you know, who the stakeholders here don't, don't really matter, but the, the general idea is leadership is defined by having a following that you can direct towards a vision. Now, you accomplish this, this, this leadership, this ability to command a following in a certain direction through two things. You know. Uh, and again, this isn't out of a dictionary or textbook. This is just sort of my, my thinking on the subject matter. There's two things that you can do. The first is you may have influence, right? There may be thought leadership. Or you may have authority. So there's influence or authority. And you know, if, if, if we just look at this idea of authority for a second, what is authority? It's the ability to take decisions and actions, right? Or another way of putting that is you could set and implement policy. And that's really a good definition for governance, right? So what is governance? Governance or governing is setting and implementing policy. And so th this is where we can tie the idea of leadership up to the, into the idea of global health governance. I know that was a little bit scattered, but does that definition of leadership and governance kind of make sense? Uh, you know, to the panel members, have I kind of got it in a nutshell or is there anything to add to that? Greg, you got it spot on. Leadership starts with a vision. And the way you've articulated it is the way that textbooks would tell us. Nicely done. Okay, brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Terry. Now, just to add to that, you know, if we just try and tie that into our discussion about uh, governance and leadership in terms in the global health space, I think we could look at it at a number of levels. At the at the supranational or, or the global level, we've got institutions and organizations like the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, UNITAID. Uh, which is part of the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the World Trade Organization. These are supranational organizations, and they provide leadership, in my mind, in, in, in two ways. And th these are the two ways that I was talking about just now. The, the first is, of course, influence, right? So these organizations can't set policy within country, but they can certain, uh, certainly advise countries you know, as to what is the current best evidence that should support uh, and direct policy, and then countries can can respond to that. Keep in mind that countries are sovereign, right? So it's very difficult for a supranational structure, a structure like the WHO to give a country an instruction. They can't do that, but they can give advice. Now, there are times when there's exceptions to that, and that is when a country voluntarily gives authority or designates authority to these supranational structures, and uh, that's often a function of, uh, of international treaties, or, or frameworks that the countries sign up to, they agree to, and then they ratify them in their national legislature. In other words, it becomes law within their countries. And a good example is the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So that's leadership 
at a supranational level. Then, of course, there's leadership within a country, and Agnes is going to talk about that in a second. But there's also an opportunity when we look at the country level. There's also an opportunity for countries to provide leadership to other countries. In other words, one country may actually implement a policy which is tremendously successful, and other countries would then follow on. So that's leadership from countries. And then, of course, you've got other actors. You've got NGOs. You've got individuals. You've got universities. And all of these other actors can be acting at a, at a, at a supranational level. In other words, they act across countries at a global level um, in advocacy, thought leadership, research, providing evidence, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of uh, leadership and governance at, in a nutshell. Um, I, but I think perhaps more important for this discussion is looking at leadership and governance at a national level. And I'm going to ask Agnes to jump right in here and talk about the role of the Ministry of Health in a country's uh, health policy development. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Um, I agree with what you say, but I also, need, I also want to emphasize that good global health governance and leadership begins at the country level. Uh, and that means country need policies, strategies, and mechanisms to bring uh, together various sectors and stakeholders. Uh, most governments mandate the ministries of health to lead these processes. And as part of this uh, responsibility, we see them uh, providing both uh, administrative and technical direction for health at the country level. They define the country's commitment to international treaties, as you've uh, alluded to earlier, and policies for health, uh, they interpret, uh, inter, um, interpret and align them to national priorities so they could be able to tap into uh, external funding for health. Uh, they also articulate the case for health as an integral part of, uh, of national development. And this pulls in the collaboration with, uh, across sectors uh, and, and different stakeholders. Um, we see also ministries of health developing national health policies and strategies to set a clear direction for what can be done within the health sector. Um, we see them also budgeting for health as part of uh, the national resource allocation. Uh, this is one of the areas that are still struggling with because a lot of uh, emerging economies are not uh, allocating enough resources to health. Uh, and, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. But again, we see them, uh, ministries of health coordinating um, health activities within the sector and outside the sector uh, to be able to, uh, to pull in uh, big goals and, and also provide care direction on how the country wants to operate on health. Um, for countries that are also uh, receiving a lot of external development assistance, uh, ministries of health um, um, responsible for managing these resources and making sure that they are aligning to the agreed policies as part of these collaborations. Uh, finally, but not least, we see ministries of health are establishing transparent and effective uh, regulatory and ac accountability mechanisms to make sure that resources that have been made available to countries and within the country are used well uh, to further and preserve health within a country. Okay, thanks very much. That's terrific. Well, obviously, we can't give a comprehensive and exhaustive summary of everything that's involved in, in global health, uh, leadership, mm -hmm. governance, and finance. But I hope that this quick overview was useful. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Um, we're going to continue the conversation over Twitter, so I'll be online tonight. If you've got questions, comments, you want to add something, uh, we'll be on Twitter. Of course, you can go to our webpage, send comments in there. We reply to everything. Uh, what, and you can, of course, put comments in the, on YouTube and in the description or just or just beneath the video. Thanks, everyone, for watching. It's been great having you here. Thanks to the panel. You guys are fantastic. I love you. Uh, to everybody watching, don't ever change. Don't do drugs. Always do your best. And we'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. Thanks a lot. Guys. <laughs>